be safe in this room if I declare that Proust is the greatest French novelist of the 20th century. <laughs> I think I can also say without fear of being contradicted that Balzac is the greatest French novelist of the 19th century. Unfortunately for the beauty of the symmetry of the argument, Balzac was not Proust's favorite novelist. <laughs> Proust was astonishingly well-read. And if one were to make a list of his, is that all right? <laughs> like this? If one were to make a list of his favorite authors, I think um, Racine, the 17th century playwright, would be at the top. He adored Saint-Simon, the memorialist of uh, the court of Louis XIV. Of course, Chateaubriand, Madame de Sévigné. He really liked Dostoevsky, uh, George Eliot, Thomas Hardy, without any reservations. But Balzac was another matter. He actually wrote at length about Balzac in a volume called Contre Sainte-Beuve, Against Sainte-Beuve, which is a collection uh, published posthumously of essays and sketches in the form of a conversation with his mother and where he really does his most to point out his problems with Balzac. He was taken aback by the clumsiness of Balzac, uh, very often of uh, Balzac's uh, style. Uh, Balzac's uh, obsession with the way money was made and his world of bankers and lawyers and shopkeepers was completely foreign to Proust. Proust never tells us anything concrete about the fortune of the narrator or of the Verdurin. Actually, Proust didn't even know how much money he had, which practically <laughs> led him to ruin. <laughs> of course, this uh, permeates uh, the way Balzac and Proust um, uh, created characters. Balzac's characters are vigorous, objective, they, they stand on their own feet, and actually even Balzac tended to see them as independent from himself. There's a wonderful little anecdote. Uh, Balzac was bored at a dinner party and said, well, let's talk about something interesting. Who is going to marry Eugénie Grandet? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, the, his, char his uh, personages are so clearly defined that any reader will tell you who is Goriot, you know, the self-sacrificing father, or Grandet, who is defined by his avarice. The answer to the question, who is Swan, is not so simple. It depends whose point of view you choose. Odette's answer would be very different from that of uh, Charlus or of the narrator's grandfather. And it certainly is not Proust who's going to tell you the answer. So why was Proust so, why did Proust read Balzac so constantly? and with a sort of passion. And this passion is found in his book because he left hidden clues about this particular obsession. Why, what attracted him? In his notes, he mentions quite revealingly that he admired the audacity with which Balzac spoke about sexual perversions. And he has Charlus say, well, it's marvelous because Balzac is acquainted with even those passions which the rest of the world ignores or studies only to castigate them. And it is true that Balzac wrote about homosexuals, about lesbians, without ever passing any moral judgment. And I think it is this neutrality that endeared Balzac to Proust. And of course, it is something he didn't like to tell outright. In principle, what is important to Proust, Proust never tells you. <laughs> when, uh, and, uh, but there is something quite telling. Proust, of the, there are about 60 writers that are mentioned in La Recherche. And, Pru and Balzac is by far the most frequently quoted. Now, generally, when Proust quotes or alludes to, to a writer, he does so perfectly openly. He quotes. He quotes and he identifies. 
that's the way he deals with, uh, with Chateaubriand, with Madame de Sévigné, with Saint-Simon. The only person, he, the only writer he never, doesn't always identify is Racine because his lines are so well known that it would be you know, just as ridiculous as if I told you that Shakespeare had written to be or not to be. With Balzac, it's another matter. Sometimes he quotes him openly, but most of the time, the clues are hidden. The careful reader sometimes stumbles on a short passage, a sentence, that has absolutely nothing to do with the surrounding text. Most of the time, it has something to do with Balzac. I'll give you three examples because Proust used this sort of trick in various ways. I'm sure you all remember in, late in the novel, in The Captive, there is the big party given, organized by Charlus at Madame, de Ver, at Madame Verdurin, the, the musical matinee. And you all remember how Madame Verdurin is furious with Charlus because he behaves in such a rude manner towards her. And she convinces Morel to uh, break openly and brutally with Charlus at the end of the evening. And she does so even though the thought does cross her mind that by creating that scene, she <coughs> might ruin her party. But she doesn't hesitate. And Proust writes, there are certain desires, some of them confined to the mouth, which as soon as we have allowed them to grow, insist upon being gratified, whatever the consequences may be. We are unable to resist the temptation to kiss a bare shoulder at which we have been gazing for too long, and at which our lips strike like a serpent at a bird. Now, this is really a bizarre metaphor. <laughs> First, because most men I know do not pounce on a lady's shoulder in a salon, and certainly no Proustian character ever does, ever does that. And then it really has nothing to do with Madame Verdurin and the scheme she has concocted. But it does come out straight out of Balzac. In one of the strangest episodes of the novel called Le Lys dans la Vallée, The Lily in the Valley, a very young man goes to his first ball and he throws himself passionately and kisses the back of an unknown lady whose white shoulder, shoulders has entranced him. So wh why does it come out? I don't know. I mean, is it a sort of unconscious thing of the part of Proust? Is it, does he, does, does he do that to amuse himself, to test his reader's attention? There's another example. Early on in Combré, when the child as, when the narrator, as a child, recalls his, his walks with his, with his parents, he says that he is struck by a lady, a young woman whose pensive face and fashionable veils did not suggest a local origin and who had doubtless come there in the popular phrase to bury herself, to taste the bitter sweetness of feeling that her name, and still more, the name of him whose heart she had once held, but had been unable to keep, were unknown there, stood framed in a window. And I watched her as she returned from some walk along a road where she had known that he would not appear, drawing from her submissive fingers long gloves of a precious, useless charm. Once more, what does this lady do there? She is never going to reappear. Absolutely no reason. But it is a masterful summing up of a novella called The Deserted Woman. And a Proust even mentions the gloves which play a role in the novella. The, the third example is very short. At one point, um, Charus invites to dinner a valet he wants to seduce. And of course, the young man borrows clothes and he looks pretty splendid in his attire. He looks so splendid that the tourists at the restaurant take him for a rich American. 
<laughs> but the waiters recognize him as a convict recognizes another convict. <laughs> now, why would a waiter evoke a convict? No reason, except that it, of course, brings to mind the last scene, uh, one of the last scenes in Splendors and Miseries of the Courtesans, where Vautrin, the escaped convict, appears in the prison yard dressed up as a Spanish um, priest and is recognized immediately by the other prisoners. Now, there are, uh, apart from these mysterious allusions, uh, there are two important themes very present in Balzac that went their way and blossom in Proust's novel. The first one is the cruelty of children uh, towards their parents. This, of course, is the subject of Father Goriot. You know, Goriot gives all his fortune to his daughters, and he dies disconsolate, destitute, and alone while the girls are parading at a ball. Well, this is a theme that, of course, is recurrent in Proust. It's illustrated by Gilbert, Gilbert who betrays the memory of her father, by the insatiable daughter of la Berma, uh, by Mademoiselle Vinteuil, who tortures to death her father uh, because of her open liaison with the young woman, and even by Saint-Loup, who treats his very loving mother so roughly. Now, there is one person in the novel who is a specialist of, uh, of Balzac and sort of vocal connoisseur of Balzac, and that is Monsieur Charlus. And I think that Monsieur Charlus would get all the mysterious episodes that I'm sure that I miss some in the novel because I'm sure there are more. I'm sure Monsieur Charlus would get all of them because he really knows his Balzac. Mm -hmm. Now, the complexity of uh, Monsieur Charlus is, owes his name to a personage that appears fleetingly in Saint-Simon. He uh, owes his family name, and his first name he may have gotten through Balzac. Palamed, which is really an unusual first name, is the name of a very lesser god. I don't know that a lot of you know about Balamé. But he is the subject of a little poem in one of the novels of Balzac in Les Paysans. And I've always wondered whether Proust did not catch on Palamé in, in Balzac. Anyway, Charlus is one of the most, is the strongest, the most complex, perhaps the, the most important character of the whole novel. <coughs> He is both tragic, widely entertaining, and uh, as you all know, he's the youngest, uh, younger brother of the Duc de Guermantes. He is thus a member of a family that considers uh, itself higher than that of the King of France. Uh, he lives as if the French Revolution had never happened. Uh, he is uh, absolutely unbeatable on genealogies, privileges, uh, his conviction that he is at the apex of French society is absolutely unshakable, and uh, to say that he's prickly is putting it mildly. <laughs> but he is more than this uh, caricature of an arch-conservative. Mr. Charles is also extremely well-read, has impeccable musical te taste, he is very open to the avant-garde, and uh, he is, uh, he, he is refined, he is an artist, and if he had had the necessary discipline, he probably would have been a writer, perhaps even a very good writer. And in Proust's, uh, the complexity of the character stems in great part, according to his author, his creator Proust, to his homosexuality. For Proust, a slight dislocation of a purely physical taste, the slight blemish in one of the senses explains why the world of poets and musicians so firmly barred against the Duc de Guermantes opens its portals to Monsieur Charles. <coughs> 